the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shahadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. Over the past decade, Hilary Mantel has appeared at the Edinburgh International Book Festival to discuss her novels based on the life of Thomas Cromwell. In 2020, she was due to visit Charlotte Square Gardens again to discuss the final book in her acclaimed trilogy, The Mirror and the Light. In March, the coronavirus took hold of the world and Britain entered lockdown. The Mirror and the Light was published and, as expected, longlisted for the Booker Prize. Mantel had planned a handful of public events to discuss her novel, but all of them had to be cancelled, including her visit to Edinburgh. Instead, the book festival invited The Guardian's chief culture writer, Charlotte Higgins, to travel to Hilary Mantel's home in Devon and film a conversation with her there. The interview you are about to see was filmed by the award-winning cameraman Toby Strong in Budley Salterton on the morning of Friday 14th of August. Hilary, I would like to ask you about mirrors, which are in the title of The Mirror and the Light, and are almost on every page of the book. There's a sense of reflection, of um, the idea of a mirror giving an image, which may be a false image or a distorting image. But there's also the idea of the mirror of princes, the idea of um, that genre of books that is the advice to the king on how to rule. And I have a sense that Cromwell is writing a kind of inverse version of that with his book of Henry in the mirror and the light. And he's also been writing it in previous books. But can you tell me about this wonderful recurrent imagery of the mirror, which runs throughout the whole wonderful trilogy of Thomas Cromwell novels? What, what work did you want that imagery to do? With the mirror and the light, was actually a phrase used by Cromwell in a letter to Thomas Wyatt, who was abroad as a diplomat. And Cromwell described Henry as the mirror and the light of other kings. 
Well, when he wrote that letter, he must have been in an extremity of distress because what he was describing to Wyatt was the burning of a heretic with whom he, Cromwell, would naturally have been in sympathy. So he is writing an inverse version of what he really believes, I think, because this must surely be a point of great tension and strain in his relationship with Henry. However, the phrase leapt out and grabbed me many years ago, and there was an evening when I was in, in, in the southeast, I was near Lewis, going over the downs at sunset. And I say Lewis because it was where Cromwell acquired property, where his son lived. And there was an absolutely beautiful light over the downs, a clear silver sky and a golden sun an hour before sunset. And I was awed by it and it seemed to go straight to the heart of the book. And I thought, this is the mirror and the light. And then it was one of those moments when it leaps out at you, go, oh, that's a title. <laughs> and that's probably a book. And yes, it plays on the idea of the instructional manuals for rulers, both mirrors for princes, mirrors for magistrates, a tradition that Cromwell and Henry would both have known well. You get these books through the medieval period and into the early modern world. But there is more because the final book in the trilogy casts new light on everything that happened before. And it acts as a mirror to the previous books. So we sometimes find that an incident from early in Cromwell's life is recounted again. But this time, we learn something slightly different, or we learn a little more, as if someone has just moved the angle from which we are looking. It's such a fascinating idea because, I mean, we see mirrors used in art, Hans Memling might put a mirror in the background of a religious painting or a century or so later, Velázquez uses the mirror. And they're often used to show, to exemplify the artifice of the artist and perhaps to trick the viewer a little bit. In other words, those mirrors don't always tell us the truth or they may tell us a partial version of the truth. There's also a wonderful passage in bring up the bodies, the beginning of bring up the bodies where you have Cromwell looking out through a paint, through a window looking at Jane and Henry walking in the garden of Wolf Hall and there's a little wobble in the glass, you say, a wobble in the glass, it's a small pane, you can't see out properly. So is there some, there's something about viewpoint and the role of the artist lurking in that image is there? It's as if Cromwell's looking at them through water and being a practical man, his first thought is they need better glaciers down here in Wiltshire. And in the th third book, there's a great deal, not just about mirrors, but windows and the breaking of windows and the breaking of glass and the perils of the glaciers trade. They're always either being burned up in kilns or they're hurtling from church roofs and impaling themselves on their own product. Art is dangerous, beauty is dangerous. And it's deceptive because glass doesn't look harmful but will pierce you straight to the heart. And there are the remnants of Anne Boleyn, the panes that say, uh, panes of glass that say H R entwined um, with 
Anne's initial. And sometimes it's just H-A, so it says ha-ha. And these are everywhere. Such a lot of money has been invested in decorating various great houses with these emblems. And then as people move through the third book, they're always spotting them and saying to each other, do you know you've got a ha-ha? Better heave a brick through that. And Charles Brandon points out, there's nothing you can do with glass. You can't overpaint it. You can't recarve it. You've just got to knock it out and start again. All that beauty and all that expense destroyed. I suppose it stands in as an emblem for waste, the waste of spirit, the waste of resources and lives that you see when Henry's reign turns sour around about 1536. But you're also holding up a mirror to the past. Are you not also the slightly partial distorting mirror of the past as yes. an artist? Yes, that's right. I'm fascinated by those Dutch houses where the people inside could see out, but you couldn't see them. And I think that is probably how you aspire to be as an artist. You don't want all your movements scrutinised. You want clarity, but you, even with the best will in the world and the greatest gift for openness, you are unable to explain precisely what you do. There's a wonderful passage in one of your earlier novels, Beyond Black, um, where you discuss, and I want to talk about this now really, what I think of as your other great subject, which is the way the past infects the present, the way the past is no, not absent, um, the way the past acts on the present. And, and in a lot of your work, it seems to me that is exemplified by the idea of the ghost or the dead. And each of these books and this amazing trilogy ends with an execution. And in the first two books, often it's the, you know, a lot of the material of the next book, in a sense, is the working out of the consequences of, of, of that execution yes. until it must come to an end because Cromwell has died. But in Beyond Black, there's the central character is a medium, and there's a passage where her assistant says to her, um, Don't you ever just want to be honest from time to time, I'm paraphrasing, and the mm. medium, Alison, says, no, that would frighten the punters. And I had this sense that that's actually like, Alison as the medium, as someone who can hear the ghosts, and, and as a kind of chaotic chorus of voices from the past, you can, and she expresses what they're saying to her to an audience, which is kind of what you're doing, but the sense that you could never really tell the truth about that stuff, it's too, it's too much. But well, I think that's right. And I, I mean, if I can employ Alison's own language, what she says is that the mediums are employed to offer a public service. She says, we're like sewage workers. We plunge headfirst into your shit. So in other words, she's saying, we deal with those things that cannot be faced and cannot be spoken. And we perform the service of cleaning up your psyche in exchange for perfunctory sums of money. And I think that in a way I was speaking for practitioners of the psychic arts, but for other artists as well. <laughs> and we are all employed on the dark side, if you like. And so it seems to me that in many ways, Beyond Black was a kind of rehearsal or a workshop manual for the trilogy that was to come. Although I didn't really know that at the time. Yes, the experience of the seance as the book festival event it sort of came out rather strongly when I reread Beyond Black recently and thought, aha, I, I'm, I'm stretching, 
I'm stretching the metaphor of ghost <laughs> as far as it will go. But the idea of something impalpable that um, can't easily be expressed, which is the world of the imagination, that, that is perhaps a kind of a version of a, of a ghost? Yes, and also looking at the historical record, it's what lies between the lines. Uh, or it's like the watermark in the paper. Every text has these ghosts. I spent a lot of time thinking about forgeries when I was writing The Mirror and the Light. None of it in the end made itself, none of it in the end made its way into the text. But I was interested in how the medieval idea of forgery is more like the shadow of a text than it's like something that is a cheat or a deception. And I, I'm aware that there's a continuum there between out-and-out -out cheating and unwitting deception, people fooling themselves and people seeing what they want to see, which is the problem that besets all historical researchers, I think. We hope to find certain things, so we have the shape of them in our minds already. And of course, we also hope that something will come out of the text and go boom, and we'll have made a new discovery. But you have to be aware that you may be fooling yourself. And is that as important for a historical novelist as it is for a, a historian occupying a university chair? I mean, but you've, you seem to be you always talk very closely I mean, on some level, I, I'm sure you consider yourself a historian. And that's not meant to be an accusation either. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you're, you know, you, the craft of history that you undertake is incredibly seriously undertaken, incredibly seriously meant and considered and done. Um, you know, you can talk on pretty equal terms with other people who've scrabbled around in the in, in the record. I know my stuff to that extent. Mm. I, I know the sources. Um, I have to do a slightly different job from a historian because once the record stops, that's where I begin. And that's where my real work begins. Once you've identified the gaps, then you work out, could they ever be filled? And sometimes you think, OK, well, it would take us a discovery of another document that bridges this gap. But sometimes you're in the realms of private life and private thought, and you know the material, by the nature of the historical record, will never come to light. We never really know what people thought, only what they said, what they did. And I suppose I spend a lot of time doubting myself, whereas historians always feel, no, not always, that's an exaggeration, but they can feel safely enclosed by the rigidity of facts that they can deduce from the record. Whereas I never feel any certainty um, that any piece of paper is quite solid. It's as if I'm always trying to turn over the back and, and see what's written there or what might have been on that piece of paper before the record we have was inked into it. Mm. So I suppose doubts of the essence for me. But it is true that through the writing of the trilogy, I've tried not to take people's word for anything. Um, if we're just looking at the historical record, I've tried to access what I can for myself. But I don't have a historian's training, and I have a great respect for those who have you know, hand me an autograph letter 
of Thomas Cromwell's and I'm just stumped. I can't read his handwriting. I need it printed. Um, none of us can be too pure. Um, and, and I'm very conscious that I must concentrate on the kind of history that serves the bigger project. It's easy to get sidetracked as well because it's fascinating in its own right. And what surprised me was just how much material there was to go at. I mean, a completely fascinating um, idea to me that, I mean, partly because the mirror and the light covers so much, has so much ground to cover, in both temporarily, it covers, um, you know, a, a, the period from from Anne Boleyn's death until mm. Cromwell's death, whereas the previous book, Bring Up the Bodies, covers a year and is really about one thing in a sense. Yes, you could yes. say the Queen dies as the mm. great event of Bring Up the Bodies, whereas there's a, a lot of things happen. I mean, big historical tectonic plates shift, the pilgrimage of grace, a lot of extraordinary shifting and um, arguing in terms of dis diplomacy and, you know, another wife <laughs> comes and goes. Yes. Um, so how, you know, technically, what is it that you do to walk, walk your way through this forest with your machete and beat a path through it that creates a narrative, a story that is doing the work that you need it to do as an artist? With Bring Up the Bodies, you're quite right. Um, it covers a span of about a year, um, nine months in greater detail. But then as we move towards Anne Boleyn's execution, it becomes even more concentrated on the month, the week, the day, the hour, and then the split second of the decapitation. So it's a book with a clock ticking loudly in the background and the seconds counting down. And so I became more and more concentrated on every possible version and interpretation of a very narrow band of, inve of events. When you move into the mirror and the light, you've got four years, during which time Cromwell becomes increasingly beset by competing forces, both in the external world and within himself. And his work in itself becomes more complex as he spreads his net of influence over the whole of the state and out into Europe. So it's a huge um, amount of material to contain. I think what I had to do was move swiftly to certain storylines and say those people and those stories are completely out of the picture. Uh, whereas other characters, we identify Thomas Wyatt as vital and we'll try to follow him. But it's not so easy because he's always out of the country. So he can't be followed, he can only be reported. And again, you pick certain stories um, that branch off from his, the story of his mistress, Bess Darrell, which involves us with the Pole family. And um, you grow your own network within it. You cannot, and I do not expect the reader to take all that in at first go, but I hope the tone the dialogue points you to the turning points. I hope the shape of the story is evident. And then if you want to, you can go back, get hold of the detail. And then the whole of the historical record is there for you to access. So it's a smooth flow through. 
I hope. You know, the, the, the novel has a lot of artificial constraints in what you can expect the reader to follow. But what I want to do is open out something for the readers, open up the world of the Tudors so people can go on their own explorations. Um, I mean, I suppose one obvious thing is that the... How do you narrow that material is that your viewpoint in all three books, Woolfall, Bring Out the Bodies and The Mirror and the Light is, is Thomas Cromwell yes. and the camera is, is sort of firmly between his eyes. Yes, <laughs> yes. The gaze is his. We um, don't go where he doesn't go. Right. He's yeah. very networked, so that's very useful. Yes, yes. <laughs> so he, he has yeah. that spy in every household. But um, that's, that kind of idea of this very focused viewpoint, of Thomas Cromwell's viewpoint, brings me to this other idea which I think is so present and so brilliant in The Mirror and the Light is how does power end? I mean, the other, it seems to me the other great subjects of these books, aside from the idea of the way the dead act on the living or the past acts on the present, is, is power and how power is an unstable thing. Power runs through your fingers. Power cannot be, cannot be held in any sort of consistent Power doesn't plateau ours. It's either rising or falling, it seems to me, in, the, yes. in these books. Um, and it's... When do the powerful see that their power is running through their fingers? And it feels like Thomas doesn't necessarily... His omnipotence runs out a little bit. Other people, we... we it's hinted that other people know a bit more in the end about what his likely trajectory is going to be but do, it, for you is there a kind of peripatia in the Greek sense is there a sort of turning point is there a moment that you can point to and say that's the moment that Thomas makes the critical mistake that means that he, he his downfall will come or is this an accumulation of small turnings in the path I think this is a really interesting question because I've had a lot of conversation with German McCullough about this, the biographer uh, um, Thomas who's Cromwell. done that marvellous work, going back to the sources and straightening out a lot of errors and approaching the whole thing again, and you know, he he tends to see a series of mistakes, uh, missteps, some of which it's very hard to see how he could have avoided, because what would the right step be? I tend to take a slightly different view. I, I, I see the whole thing as unfeasible and unlikely from the start. Now, the, the metaphor that people used in the Middle Ages was the Wheel of Fortune. Even the great families knew that they would rise and decline, but they would rise again. Now, if you're in Thomas Cromwell's position, not affixed to a great family or an interest group, that's not your metaphor. Your metaphor is the ladder. And there is no model for the way he climbs. He makes his own ladder. He brings it and he leans it against the institutions of state and he begins to climb. But somebody's got to be at the foot of that ladder and who will that be and can you trust them and then what do you do when you get to the top and for him top is the moment the king promotes him to Earl of Essex which and this is the way Dermot McCullough sees it and I, I totally agree with this would be what would so upset his enemies that they cannot endure it any longer because what next duke and so they say what next king i'm planting henry's mind the idea that cromwell is not lo loyal and is in fact meditating some kind of coup cool or takeover it's all supremely unlikely but henry was a man who could be rushed and panicked and he believed this for long enough for it to terminate Cromwell's career. 
Now, given the international situation and the way it turned against him in the last months of his life, I am not sure how the most adroit and oily politician could have extracted himself. So to say that I think it was always going to come crashing down doesn't mean it was futile. And it is hard sometimes for us to remember the simple point that we know what happened, but they didn't. And they're going forward in optimism and good faith day to day. They don't know what will happen in the next 10 minutes. And I am sure that Cromwell lived in two realities, one of which in his grey hairs he retires to the country loaded with honours and lives out his days at Lawn Abbey, and the other which ended precisely the way it did. I think you have to factor in the knowledge that Henry also was an uncontrollable factor mm. uh, because he was becoming more real, more irascible, less predictable day by day. And each day you never knew what you would find. So there is no rational way through. But that's where the artist gets to decide, in a sense, in the architecture of your piece of work. You, it's your choice what causes Thomas's downfall, isn't it, in a sense? It is, but I feel because I must try to faithfully represent the historical mm. record, I have to give an idea of the range of causes, but I don't take a position on which of those was decisive. Mm. You know, some historians will say, it was the promotion. Others will say it was events in Calais. Mm. Others will say it was all to do with um, making the Duke of Norfolk dig up his ancestors by suppressing Thetford Abbey. And there were causes great, causes small. And to my mind, it's completely false to start picking between them at this distance. Just say there's one great inextricable knot that he cannot mm. untie. And the crucial thing, I think, is that, as you're reading, the sense that he doesn't know. You know, he cannot know the future, and that is, that is absolutely clear, that he is living in his moment. And he's a man who's got an acute appreciation, I think, of exactly where he stands at any one time with everyone. And he must have seen the forces massing against him. All the time, and I've said this through the trilogy, his only friend and resource is the king. And Cromwell had an extraordinary grip on Henry because he knew how vulnerable he was to the last person who talked to him. So in a crisis, he more or less said to Henry, go into that room and don't come out, and monitored access. Access to the king was always the vital thing. So one of Cromwell's ploys when he destroyed the Boleyn faction was to put his own people in the privy chamber near to the king. So these are the faces he's seeing day by day. They're Cromwellian faces. And what you have here is such a highly personal style of government. Mm. And at the centre of it, an individual who's highly unpredictable. And what you're describing is a form of government that is completely alien to our own form of government. And yet this, um, this the way power operates in the, in the terms of your book, I think is just intensely recognisable. I think it would have been alien to us until quite recently. It, it's certainly far from any idea of democracy. But uh, um, I think that nowadays 
once again, the image counts for so much. An image can be so easily constructed. So you have a figure like Donald Trump who shows every sign of being prepared to tear up his own country's constitution and would love to do that if it suited him. Then you get some idea of what it is when an individual exercises arbitrary power. So I think we're perhaps a little more equipped to understand personality cults and personal reigns mm. today than we would have been a few years back. What about in relation to our own government? Well, again, we have a leader who's all image and no substance. And the soundbite has become the preferred method of ruling, both here and in America. So, um, although we seem to live in an age of information, it is just as easily distorted by rumour and moral panics and conspiracy theories as Henry's age. This really interested me when I came to write about the Pilgrimage of Grace, the revolt that broke out in the North Country, which was the most serious threat to Henry's power in his whole reign. And what you find is the mystery of how people communicate in a country with such a poor infrastructure. And how is it that some song deriding the government is sung in Durham one day and Cornwall the next week? Without Twitter. How do these things <laughs> transmit? But you have here a country governed and policed by rumour. And it's very interesting to me what's happening on uh, on the internet nowadays, how how beliefs are transmitted, how distorted the information flow becomes. I lived in Saudi Arabia for a time um, in the 1980s and there again you were living in a country with no clean data and everyone's life proceeded on the basis of leaks and rumours. And I th think at that time I got a good idea what it must have been like to live in a pre-modern state with hardly any mass media and no internet in those days, where you were always inclined, everyone was inclined to construct conspiracies where there were probably just cock-ups. So you were in a place where you were a victim, but also you were inadvertently part of the corruption of information. And that, you think, is there's a recrudescence of that now? That kind of idea of yes. the conspiracy taking I, hold? And... I, I, I think, again, that... Um, it's not the means of um, transmitting the information that matters so much as the way people decide to hear and receive it. Mm. And in some respects, when you look at what was happening, say, to Thomas Cromwell's reputation um, back in 1536 at the time of the rebellion, th what they tell him is that the further away from London the further away from people who have known and seen you, the worse you get and the less human you get. So um, within the M25, as it were, you're only a sorcerer. But by the time you get up to the Scottish borders, you've got horns and a tail. Now, the physical distance doesn't matter so much, but there are a lot of sub-satanic um, theories flying around, I think, mm. that suggest that the world works in infinitely mysterious ways and that the power structures as we know them 
our only species. They're only a blind, they're a distraction. That's not how things really work. Mm -hmm. So it's all become highly mystical and mm -hmm. quite medieval, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, going back to Henry, something you alluded to earlier, the idea that he was getting more ill. He's getting yes. more ill in The Mirror and the Light. And there's a certain focus on the person of the king, which is the phrase yeah. that's used, which is the body of the king. And the, whether the king is in good or ill health is of huge importance, whether his leg is hurting. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot in this, in, in this third novel about what happens when you get ill. You know, what if, you, what if your malaria from your old Italian life comes back just at the crucial, at crucial political moment? The idea of these great figures of history being trapped in bodies that are frail and fragile. Anyway, we are living in year one of a new disease which has made us very aware of our own persons and their fragility. But it struck me, they, they of course, your characters know very well how to deal with these outbreaks of disease. You know, there's a keep back from the king if, if you have so much as a cough. But could you talk a bit about that idea of the body in, in The Mirror and the Light? There's intense focus on Henry's body as the royal body and corresponding to the body politic. And the ancient idea that if the king is ill, the realm, the Commonwealth, cannot be healthy, which I think is so psychologically embedded, not least in kings, that it flows beneath the surface of their overt words and deeds. And what you get in Henry after 1536 is a huge loss of confidence in his body. He's carrying this leg injury, which probably there's an infection that goes into the bone. And it's not a case if it won't heal, but he can't be allowed to heal. The doctors have to keep it open. So my reading of Henry is that every day he's in pain, sometimes more, sometimes less, but he's never going to forget that wound. And other things are beginning to go wrong with his body. Now, Henry had been the golden boy. He'd been the great athlete, the great sportsman. There was a time when he put on his armour to go jousting, at which he was a champion. And you can't fake it. You can't let the king win. He was good. He was every bit as good as he thought he was. And so there's the royal body, strong and muscular, safely encased in its golden armour. And then he has to stop jousting. Age is catching up with him and infirmity. He takes off the armour. The royal body begins to sprawl and it begins to leak. And its inner secrets can no longer be contained. And the royal body is so scrutinised. His natural waste products are examined by the doctors every morning. And everyone is most keen to know, is he potent? What can he do in bed with his wife? Can we have a look at the sheets, please? Uh, every morning, the doctors are there to interrogate him. And he is a man, I think, trying to hide in many respects, trying to hide his weakness and yet a king can't hide. He has to be painted by Hans Holbein and again padded out so that he hasn't got armour on, but it looks like armour because where in that great bloated padded body is the real Henry? And this is what fascinates me as you follow his natural history which is also his political history. When you are in pain and you're in chronic pain, it erodes your personality. You are not at all times accountable and rational. And his ministers must have known this. And Cromwell himself, as you say, at a crucial moment was let down by the return of a tertian fever. 
So he, he's, it's a vital parliamentary session. Measures are being brought in that he does not like. He can't get there to stop them. One day in three, he can work and then he's knocked off his feet again. He generates an amazing amount of work in those days when the fever falls and then it rises again and he's out of it. And these, regrettably, are the biological accidents that contribute to the success or failure of a man's whole political career. Yeah. Yeah. On, on tiny bodily um, frailties, the whole sort of course of history rests. Indeed, the... and there's no one who illustrates that better than Henry VIII, I think. This is not the Henry of the last seven years, who is obviously suffering from multiple pathologies. We don't know what they are, but his whole body and his face became very strange and he was living an invalid's life. But again, after Cromwell's time, all sorts of things began to deteriorate in the Commonwealth as well as the King. So Cromwell's body might have been more important to him than <laughs> he would have liked to have admitted. But Hilary, Cromwell is dead, you have killed him, finally, again. But to have you laid the body out, have you put pennies on his eyes? Is he ready to go down or No, he's bring... vigorous and lively as ever. Now, on the page of the theatre adaptation. And next year, God willing, in person, on the stage. Um, and in due course, the TV adaptation, which I will be involved in, though, you know, at a, a lesser level. But I always knew that I was going to give the stage adaptation a go. So it's been in my mind all the time I've been writing the Miranda Light that there won't be a pause, we'll just roll on. He gets up, puts his head back on, and off we go. And do you have, have you imagined an artistic life for yourself yet beyond Thomas Cromwell? Are you working on anything? Well, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in working in the theatre. I, I haven't got another big historical novel in view. And I think that's quite important to say, so I hope people will stop writing to me with suggestions. <laughs> 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 and... Um, it's lovely that people have the appetite for it, but considering the pace at which I proceed, I, I would like some life before it's too late. So if I lock myself into another 15-year project, I, I, I probably won't live that long. It's simple as that. So my first thing, I think, apart from disinterring my box full of, of scenes for other plays is to go back to some short stories because I have several short stories that I had an idea part way through the mirror and the light. Can't concentrate on that now, so scribble for three hours and then put it in a box. And it may be that none of them will work out. I don't have a great strike rate with short stories. I often find they fall over and I have to abandon them. But I'd like to see if there's any potential there. So if I'm thinking my way then into 2021, I imagine I'll be, if we manage to get the play into rehearsal and into performance, I imagine that will take up quite a lot of time as well. And I'm exhausted. I will frankly say that, that the last three, four years particularly have been hard and I haven't really had, had any, any break or downtime in between. 
managing the totality of a project like this, you see, it's absolutely central to my life as a writer, and I know that. But whatever comes afterwards, I'm determined that it won't be some sort of mere coda or a sort of tailing off of effort. I think I can do original work. What I hope is I might surprise myself. Hilary, I am so looking forward to being surprised as well. This has been such a joy and pleasure for me. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>